hello. There you go. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Good morning. Appreciate you guys taking the time to come into the first talk. Sometimes that's uh, hard to do, right, after uh, a good night. And so today we're going to talk about um, one topic that it has been, for me, very interesting to dive into. Um, I'm a security researcher, so I don't have much of the background of a data scientist. And when I started hearing about AI and all the applications that other companies were showing, other people were using a chatbot just to see what they can do with it, right? Trying to, um, to explain some code, trying to write some code, et cetera. And I think that that was pretty interesting. So my goal was for the past five to six months, I was actually trying to dive into that topic. And then I started just trying to do some experiments and take some notes. And then this keynote is bringing all that in here Hopefully it makes sense. This is just all the stuff that I've been taking notes once again. And then uh, hopefully I can inspire you to do your own experiments. And I'm releasing an open source project today. Something little, still a work in progress, but hopefully it can help us all. Just a big disclaimer, I'm just an AI cybersecurity enthusiast. Um, you can actually put that in your LinkedIn if you wanted to from now on. I think everybody could do that. Um, and also, this is once again my own experiments, things that I've actually been doing outside of work most of the time. Um, so just, just make sure that that's clear in there. And so I was already introduced, but just an extra, I guess, some more metadata about me. <laughs> so I'm also uh, sharing all my research in the Open Thread Research GitHub organization. So if you want to see all the stuff that I've been doing, you can just go there. And most of the stuff that I do, it's released through there. And I love dogs and open source in that order, so just, just in case. And that's my baby, Stevie. Uh, she's two years old, and she still thinks she's... Um, five months or two months, I think. Um, OK, so, so today we're going to talk about, once again, the fundamentals. Go straight to talk about GPT models, what they are, and then show you a few Jupyter notebooks with some code that you can take back home and that you can also do your own experiments with. Now, fundamentals, this is going to be very high level, but it's still a little, a little bit complex, but high level enough where I won't show any mathematical functions and anything like that, because that's what actually, for me, was a big obstacle, just to try to learn the specific formulas, it was just too much. So I just wanted to share the way how I learned it, and hopefully that also helps you as well. So let's just start with the basics, right? What's artificial intelligence? And artificial intelligence overall is pretty much algorithms that would enable a system to be able to mimic or replicate human intelligence. And intelligence is the ability to be able to process data, be able to learn from data, make decisions, make predictions um, towards a specific goal, right? So this concept is not new, right? So a lot of you might be thinking, this is something that just started a couple of years ago, and now I just started hearing it. But it dates back all the way to 1950s, 1940s. Actually, in 1956, the term artificial intelligence was coined in a conference in New Hampshire. Now, machine learning is a subset of AI. That was the first thing that I didn't know. I just thought machine learning was its own thing, AI was its own other thing and deep learning, et cetera. It was just all over the place. But it's a subset of AI. And the basic thing here is that we moved from telling the algorithm what to do based on rules to now tell the algorithm to learn from data. That's just the basic you know, concepts in there. Next one, deep learning is a technique, or let's just also call it a subset of machine learning, which relies also in the concepts of neural networks. And when we talk about deep learning, it's because we are actually using those neural networks to learn more complex um, relationships, and we're using multiple neural layers in order to process a lot of data. That's kind of like the difference between the basic neural networks and the deep neural networks. And around 2017 is where one of the discoveries, um, something that, that was proposed that changed the way how translation of text and understanding how a sequence of, of text can be translated to other sequence could actually be taken at scale, and the whole process could be parallelized as well. That foundation is what currently we are in this area where we are just talking about what can we do with this chatbot? Like, what can I generate? Some code, some text, an essay, maybe a letter, maybe my own resume, right? But all of that is because this architecture of transformers allows us to create these large language models that now can be used as foundation models, general models that you can then adapt and tune in order to perform a specific task. 
And one of those tasks is, is actually generating content, right? Text, images, audio, etc. So let's go back to the basics, right? <laughs> What's a neuron? And a neuron is known as a perceptron. It's what receives input from us, what we want the, the neuron to actually process and be able to give us an output, be able to predict something for us, right? And the process includes numerical values that we call weights. And weights allows us to then um, take the input, transform that input, and then pass it to the next layer. There is concepts of bias as well, some additional numerical values. And then we have the concept of an activation function. So similar to how our neurons work, where something needs to be activated when we're thinking, when connections happen, that's kind of like the concept in here, which sets the output of a neuron in a scope sometimes from 0 to 1 or negative 1 to 1, for example. It's just a way to structure the output so that we can pass it to the other uh, neuron. So this concept, you can have multiple neurons. You can have multiple layers of neurons. This is called the hidden layers. You have inputs, you have outputs, and when you go from the input all the way to the output, that's actually called forward propagation. And the reason why I like to explain it like that is because when I read that, I don't know exactly what it is. When I Google it, it throws me into a paper and I have to read all the math. But the basic concept is you go from input to output, process information over multiple layers of neurons, that's considered forward propagation. And there is where the learning actually happens. Now, you can actually have an output, as I mentioned before. And if you understand the output, if you know exactly what you want your system to predict, you can then calculate what is called the loss. And oh, it actually went too far. One second. There you go. There you go. OK. So you can actually calculate the loss. So Every time your neuron goes from input to output, there is going to be some type of error if it's the first time that it's doing it. It's trying to learn about your input. Now it knows how close it can actually be to your expected output. And it goes through the process of backpropagation, which is trying to identify how much a weight is contributing to the overall loss, to the overall error. And it goes from the output backwards, one layer at a time, one weight at a time, to understand what is what is it that the weight is doing that is causing part of the error or the overall error? You can actually calculate that weight in relationship to the loss, and we want to minimize the loss. So what we do, first, the concept of gradient would allow your weight, let's say, to point go up, because that's by default what the gradient would do, a positive gradient. So we want to do a negative gradient which allows us to then, every time we go through a forward propagation process, we can start getting closer and closer to, um, to get to what is called a loss is minimized, right? To make sure that we can reduce the loss, but still be able to have a, a model that could allow us to perform our task, right? So this is pretty much what happens all the time, over and over and over. Goes there, gets the loss, identifies what needs to be changed, you change the weights, adjust the weights, depending on how actually closer you're getting to minimize the loss. And that's the whole process of learning from a neuron, from a neural networks. And that operation is the basics of everything that is actually going on nowadays, uh, especially when we talk about GPT models that use transformers, transformers use neural networks. This is the basics and some of the terminologies that I hope it helps also through the whole right, presentation. The output of this it's going to be the weights, because the weights will tell you exactly what it learned, how it was tweaked, so that it got to the point that you accepted how, uh, how minimum the loss was. And now that's pretty much an array of numbers that you can then share and use now after training and be able to predict something else, right? And the reason why I mention this is because the weights are what we also call them parameters. So when somebody says GPT models do have 170 five billion parameters, that's what it is. It's a large neural network where the weights were adjusted through training, and now that's what is taken out of the neural network and then used in order to perform actions, right? This is called um, fit-forward neural networks. And the reason why I mentioned this is because when you start thinking about processing sequence of inputs or text through a neural network, this might not be the most ideal type of neural network to actually use. And 
a feed forward neural network doesn't have any type of feedback loop, right? We do have uh, the backpropagation to calculate error, but we don't actually go see some, some other inputs and outputs, go back and continue doing stuff before we try to calculate the error. Why is this important? It's because most of the issues or things that we're trying to solve, let's say, with these big models, is to be able to understand sequence of events, um, sequence of actions, multiple words, uh, and then those words can turn into multiple paragraphs, long paragraphs, so we need to understand sequence of words. So the first attempt was to say, let's just replicate every single neural network, take one word, calculate it, take another word, and continue doing that. But unfortunately, that doesn't work because there is not a relationship between some of the output and some of the input. We need to have some type of relationship between those neural networks, for example. And there is where the concept of recurrence started to show up in this journey of understanding neural networks. And the way how it works is that in one specific step or word at a time, you can process it. There is going to be an state that is going to be captured. And then that gets passed to the other neuron. The next word comes in, acknowledges the state, process it, and then move to the other word and does it as a sequence, right? That's what is called a recurring network, trying to understand sequence of words at a specific time. That's what we call recurrent neural networks. And that's also one of the interesting concepts that the transformer was trying to improve because this is not efficient. And but the basic concept of, of recurrent neural networks is that now it allows us to understand what we can do with those type of networks. We can take, for example, several words and have an, one output. So think about, for example, a phishing email, and I say, oh, this is malicious, this is not malicious. You can have one too many. You might be able to push a, an image and then say, tell me what you know about the image. So multiple outputs. Or you can have the concept of translation, multiple words that then you would like to take that as an input and then be able to translate multiple words at the same time. That's the concept that where the concept of transformers was actually built for. Multiple sequence of text in order to be translated. So the way how it works is it uses the concept of encoders and decoders, where you have an input like this, the encoder processes that input, there is going to be a numerical representation of that sequence of text, and then you have a decoder which is going to take that and then be able to produce the text. Now, how do, do neural networks actually get that information? And that's also super important because most of the terminology here is what I keep seeing all over and over in every single blog post that I try to use to learn about these concepts. It talks about tokenization, talks about embeddings, what is all that? When you try to fit a word into a neural network, you cannot just throw the word and say, hey, just process that word. That needs to be in a numerical value. So the first thing that you need to do is tokenize that word. So, oh, I'm sorry, that sequence of words. So that would end up into a sequence of words, as you can see in here, just to simplify it. Some of the tokenization actually can take characters from a word, right? But just to make it simple, once you do that, and you're working with a model that has its own vocabulary of words, those models will allow you to say, I can show you where those words exist in my vocabulary, the specific indices where they are, and then I could give you the numerical representation of those, of those words, for example. And that's what you pass to a neural network. And that is not just a number attached to a word. Word embeddings actually capture the semantics of the word, like how it relates also to other similar words. And what I mean by that is like if you talk about dogs, cats, Paris, France, Eng England, London, so that is also captured in the word embedding. And that's what is also so important because we need to understand the, the context around that word when we pass it to a neural network. Let's use our inefficient or inefficient neural network to go through this process. What happens is, as I mentioned before, now that we understand the concept of embeddings, we take every single word, get the embedding, pass it to the first neural network, and then go to this recurrent process, right? Capturing the state of the first one, passing the second input with the previous state, and so on. 
that at the end will give you, once again, the embedding representation of a word. And then you can use that in order to start decoding and translating something, right? That was the basics of how can we apply recurring neural networks for translation of text. Many sequences of words to many sequences of words. This, unfortunately, has some issues, right? One of the issues is that it works great for a certain length of sentences, but once you start going into paragraphs and longer text, it just cannot keep up with the meaning of something that happened late in the, in the sentence or the paragraph to something that happened at the beginning. So this was not um, as effective to be able to process and, and right, process large amounts of data as well. So transformers came to the picture. And transformers, just to not get you scared, is just an encoder and a decoder. But I'm not going to go through all of those things because that's just crazy. Uh, but at least I'm going to tell you that some of the things that it brought to the conversation now is the concept of no recurrence. I'm not going to be doing those things one thing at a time because that's not efficient. And that's, that doesn't scale. I cannot apply parallelism. So I cannot use GPUs, for example, to process this. Then it brought the concept of positional encodings and also attention. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit, what that means. Oh, and encoders and decoders. You will hear about concepts like GPT. GPT is a decoder. Other models like BERT from Google, it's an encoder and decoder. So you can have different models for each part of this machine translation concept. Right? So if we compare it with our previous um, the architecture, instead of going one thing at a time, we just take the whole thing, calculate the embeddings, and throw it directly to the transformer. That's already efficient. We just get rid of the, all the one-by-one one steps. But unfortunately, we lose position of the word. When you pass one word at a time, you could say first word, second word, third word, fourth word. If you pass everything, you can't do that. right? So what transformers brought to the conversation was positional encoding, where you can have the embeddings of the words at the concept of where they actually uh, need to be. And that becomes a position-aware encoding, for example. Something simple, just get the word, get the numerical value of the word, understand the semantics of the word, understand where is position, and that's what we call position-aware encoding. Something that I did not know what that even was, and maybe there is, of course, more context to this, but I don't want to have a headache uh, going through all these things. Self-attention, just the basic concept of attention is that when you have a sequence of words, you can actually understand how one word can be related to the rest and how strong their relationship is with certain words. That's the concept. And transformers actually do that on their own. This is another example where if, when you translate English to French, which, by the way, don't ask me to say the French word here because I'm not that good at it. Um, but you can see how in the, in the two English sentences, the word it in the first one meant animal or refers to the animal. And the second one refers to the street, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yep. So you can see how the the, this model allows us to understand the relationship with other words and without needing to have all this one by one you know, processing and large amount of memory, it actually could understand this, this. So transformers now are becoming a thing, not just for text. It was built once again for translation, but now the architecture and the concepts are being used by more than just text. So it's becoming this cross-modal general architecture. So when it comes to text, we can talk about large language models now. And a large language model is a neural network that, for example, could use a transformer architecture, um, process large amounts of data, and be able to produce parameters. And those parameters are the ones that would help us then to understand, for example, statistical relationships in a language, and this would be um, at scale, right, with a lot of information. So one interesting part in here that we're missing is, wait a minute, but so far you're talking about training something, but you were talking about that you need to somehow know the actual target value, so when you predict something, you can tell it where it was wrong. When we talk about large amount of data, you cannot just do that because you cannot label every single thing that is out there in the internet, right? So there's this concept of self-supervised learning that allows the model to actually learn based on the information that it's processing as an as a input, but at the same time, it's actually, for example, trying to predict a word 
after a, a sentence, it's trying to mask a few words, and that's how it starts learning on its own, for example. So, now, when we talk about training, pre-training, it's very important to understand as well. You can have a model that would go through a lot of data, a lot of money, a lot of computation, a lot of so many days, months, and you will get, from a large language model perspective, you will get a pre-trained model. Something that is just there, has a lot of knowledge of the language, but you will have to actually tweak it, fine tune it, in order to be on a specific, um, uh, to be useful for a specific or a special action, for example. You can still use it for certain things that I'm going to show you in a little bit, but if you want to be very specialized and, and maybe reduce the amount of errors that this base model, pre-trained model now can have, you have to fine-tune it. And that's what we mean with pre-trained and fine-tune. So think about this for a second. Base large language models, like, for example, GPT-3 and 3.5, when you tell it to predict the next word, it would do it for you. But if you actually ask it something directly, it will get a little confused. It will be like, wait, you're asking me for similar um, questions? I can do that. I can just provide similar. You will have to fine tune that in order to be able to hold that type of conversation. So there is a concept of instruction tune LLM, or large language model, that it's a pre-trained model that you can actually fine-tune in order to interact with you as if it was actually a conversation and, you know, understanding instructions, right? So GPT models, now that we understand some of this, are a generative pre-trained transformer model. So I hope that that's clear now, what GPT is. So rather than telling you what it is in the first slide, I hope that the explanation kind of helped a little bit. Um, and the concept here is that this model was, was trained to predict the next word, went through processing a lot amount of data, and then the interesting part in here, of course, is transformer base, but it's the, the, the concepts in here now, I hope that they make more sense. It's 175 billion parameters, 96 hidden layers, so layers of neurons, and it was trained on apparently 500 billion words or tokens is what I was also reading. This type of model is what we also call a foundational model, because it's a model that now you can use, you can adapt that model, and you can perform other tasks, or you can fine tune it, as I mentioned before. And the concept of foundation or general models means that before we had all this knowledge about language, there were specific models that were being created for one specific task. You would collect label data, not large amount of data, but you will collect enough data, you will build a model, you will try to solve the problem. Let's solve phishing, let's solve ransomware. So you build specific models for each specific task. A foundation model, because it has this um, knowledge, foundation knowledge, it could actually be super useful to then be able to be fine-tuned with some small amount of data, as I showed you before, and then be able to even achieve better results than a regular task model. If it doesn't make sense, let's talk about my dog, Stevie. So Stevie, using Midjourney, now it becomes that cartoon. So think about Stevie. My dog um, is a foundation model because my dog actually knows, uh, it could be adapted it has enough knowledge as a dog of the things that it could do. Sit, come, stay, right? All this stuff. But if I wanted to be a special, specific task, I need to fine tune Stevie. And if I wanted to be a rescue dog, it's not as easy as say, come, sit, right? Stay, right? It, it has to go through a really, um, more than just trying to say a word and then expect the dog to do something, right? So that, that's the concept of foundation models. That, that's how you can talk about it if somebody wants this to be explained in, uh, in other terms. Now, these models, as I mentioned before, because they do have enough foundational, foundational knowledge, you can adapt them to do things such as tell me, based on your knowledge, a poem. Write something for me. You can adapt it without fine-tuning it. And that is changing the way how we think about traditional ML. Now it has turned into prompt-based ML. A prompt is something that you ask, a, a, a query that you run against the model in order to perform a task, right? So that's pretty interesting, how we went from the typical 
to now, if you're a prompt engineer, that, that, that's going to be a thing uh, soon, uh, a, a, a job about prompt engineering. And out of the box capabilities of these type of models, you have to understand that exists the understanding of language and the generation of something, text. Because that's how you're going to start categorizing what use cases you can actually use it for. On the top, you're talking about understanding code, for example, understanding commands that command lines, and you just want to want it to tell you exactly what's going on. Sentiment analysis, what I showed before, a phishing email. You can use these models to you know, provide that type of task. On the bottom, the generation piece, you start talking about text summarization, a bunch of incidents, summarize that, maybe summarize it with this other incident um, uh, stack, and, and you know, tell me what's going on right away, right? This also helps to dialogue systems as well, right? Because you can start going back and forth and create some type of conversations. Text generation, because you can tell it to write things for you, and text translation also. And this applies not only to English, to French, uh, that type of translation. You can actually have language to code, for example, like SQL queries, etc. right? So now that we went through all of this, this is all the foundations of what the basics of these models are, starting from neuron, neural networks. We now know about GPT, some of the basics of GPT as well, some of the capabilities. So what can we do with something like this? So my goal is to share some of the experiments that I did um, to be able to inspire you, hopefully, so you can do your own. And the idea here, we can just jump directly to the code. So the way, oh, and, uh, yeah, okay. I put together this um, Jupyter book, which I'm going to be releasing today. Um, this is not complete. This is just the first iteration. And in here, what we're trying to do is show you that the first step, and hopefully you guys can see it. Yes? Is that good? OK. Maybe I can do one more. Maybe that? That? All right. Um, so the first thing we need to do is import our libraries to start interacting with some of the uh, companies like OpenAI that allows you to use their GPT models via an API, right? You can also use other models as well, but let's just do um, you know, OpenAI for now. You need to define your OpenAI key, like set it. I usually set it as an environment part of a .env file, and then I just use the .env in order to load those uh, environment variables, and then I set it to a variable, so that way I don't disclose my key while I'm talking to you guys, right? <laughs> Um, so the next step is to create a function that would allow us to interact with this API. And the first thing we need to do is define the model. So now we know that we're dealing with GPT models. GPT 3.5 Turbo is the model before GPT 4. 4 is the current one used by um, some applications, like this chatbot that exists out there. And, but 3.5 is the one where we actually have enough documentation. Now, so we define the model. We also want to pass messages to this uh, call. And then we have the temperature. Temperature tells, uh, you can tell the, 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 the model how creative, how much randomness you would like to add to the responses. If you set it to five, six, seven, that, that might start hallucinating a little bit more for you. So the first concept would be simple, something very simple. Let's start interacting with this. Let's create a prompt and say, classify the email subject text below. You have to, the, the the key in, in prompting is you have to be very specific, right? So I want it to be between those three single quotes, and I just give it that name. Right away, this one says, goes and says, uh, this is benign. It's just an email subject. Text appears to be a legitimate request, whatever. But now what we can do is implement concepts such as few shot learning, which is how you adapt the model a little bit to be able to respond in a certain way. So in this case, what I'm saying is, I'm going to give you a few examples. So few shot learning will just provide context before it tries to ask the question. So I'm giving it some subjects, and that's, that's misspelled, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and then I give it a label, and I say, look, if you see this, 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 it's malicious. If you see something like this, it's benign. If I run this again, it tells me, oh, yeah, that's malicious, by the way. The same subject, right? the same email subject as the one before. This basic exercise, that's the concept of be able to adapt the model to do something else that probably it couldn't do before. 
And if you start interacting with this, of course, this is a basic example, but just imagine this at scale. You can build an email classifier, right, um, with, something, with, a, with a foundation model like an LLM. The next one is going to be summarizing. So let me just make this bigger. Same concept, import libraries, get the key, get my function to interact with OpenAI, and then I give it another prompt. So in this prompt, I'm saying, hey, and this is also, uh, let, me, let me make sure that we can, da, 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 da. yeah. There you go, that's much better. Um, we can actually play a little bit with the prompts. We can actually have the text that we would like the model to actually uh, process, right, to tell me something about. And then I can create a, 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 an initial prompt where I can actually tell it, your task is to do this. You today are going to be a cybersecurity professional specialized in reverse engineering, for example. So you can actually uh, provide some of that context, and because the model has this foundational knowledge of language, it will be able to provide some of that context in the responses as well. So in here, we pass the evidence, and then it's going to tell us, oh, the actor is disabling Windows Defender, is deleting files, is doing all this stuff. It's, it's missing a few things in there, but that's okay, just for the example. But you can see how powerful it could be for security analysts that don't have much of that probably um, knowledge because they are juniors, right? Probably they are coming from a different um, background, different field. So it would be super helpful, right? And the last thing that I want to talk about, and, and hopefully we still have enough time in there, is this last experiment that was super cool that I just was thinking, what, what else can I do with this? Right? What else can I do with this LLM? Can I maybe start asking questions about my own data? Because the model will respond up to the date where it was trained. All the knowledge, all the things that it knows is up to when it finished training. Whatever happens after that, it won't be able to answer. We can actually ask, hey, how is NorthSec 2023? And it would be like, I don't know. I finished training in 2021, so I don't know what happened in the past two years. That, that's exactly what you will get. So in this scenario, we're going to use the concept of retrieval augmentation, where you can actually provide also your data and now be able to ask questions based on that data. And that's also how you can adapt the model a little bit to be able to interact with knowledge that doesn't exist anywhere else. Now, granted, this example is using APIs, so some of the data is going out, but this is just an example, right? And in here, the interesting piece, as I mentioned before, is that the world exists at a static snapshot. And then um, the idea behind is actually to be able to ask a question. And maybe this next image will <laughs> make more sense. But you ask a question, you um, start understanding how similar your question is to the knowledge that you have in a, vector, in a vectorized database, and then you can pass that context to the model. So what does that mean? So what I did is I wanted to replicate what it would be in a threat intel team, or in a company that has in, in, intel, and then it has all this knowledge about threat actors that you cannot share with anybody else because it's your intel. Maybe you want to share some, yes, with other partners, but there is some knowledge that you cannot share, right? So I was thinking, you know what? What public knowledge has some of that context in the world? MITRE ATT&CK groups does have that type of information where they collect information about groups, public information, and they map all this knowledge to all the groups. So there you are. That's my Intel database from, for my POC. So why not do that? So what I did is I have this Python library that I wrote. It's, it, it's a GitHub uh, project that allows me to query data from MITRE ATT&CK in a sticks format. MITRE ATT&CK does have a database. It's a taxi server database where you can just get the data. So I wrote some code with this library. I create documents. I tokenize my data. I hope that tokenize now makes sense, right? And then I create the embeddings. I hope that also makes sense again, right, of every single document. So we tokenize embeddings, and then I put it into a database that understands numerical values that will represent a, a, a document and the semantics of the document, right? So now when I run my query and I say, hey, I would like to know more about these threat actors that exist in MITRE ATT&CK, 
But if I go to the MITRE ATT&CK search capability through the website, all I can do is keyword-based search, right? All you can do is type phishing, process injection, discovery, and then it tries to find the documents. But what if I want to ask what are the top phishing techniques or what are the most common phishing techniques in your whole database? The whole website goes down, right? <laughs> because it, cannot, it doesn't understand that type of conversation. So, we start with our query. Our query is going to be embedded. That embedding is going to be compared with whatever we have in the database. So it knows what's similar, my query and the documents, and it brings me the top five, top 10 documents. Then I can just have that uh, and pass it to the LLM and say, here is my context. I would like to know what are the most common techniques that are used um, in the world, right? Something like that. So let's do that. And that's the last example. So just making sure I don't want to go over that. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. By accident, I click other buttons. Uh, da, da, da. All right. And then let's get rid of this. All right. So this is going to walk through the whole thing. And once again, the code is going to be, there you go. So we import our attack Python client library. We define some, some variables. We initialize the, the attack client. I wrote a give me all the groups function, right? G give me all the groups. That's pretty much what it does. And then I start getting information about all the groups that exist at MITRE ATT&CK and all, some of the information such as techniques, et cetera, of MITRE ATT&CK. Then I create the way how I want to structure my documents. Because the way how I was before, it just has information that I don't want. I just want to have specific things in there. So that's what it does. It just allows me to pick what it is that I want my documents to be like. And I'll, I'll uh, da, 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 go down. So I start processing, creating markdown files for every single uh, threat actor. And that's what you see in companies that are tracking Intel. You have a threat actor. You have a summary of the, of the threat actor. And you have connections, of course, to evidence and things like that. But the, the, the primary overview of the threat actor is super important, right? So we go through all this. And now we use a tool called Langchain. Super useful. If you want to dive into these examples, it simplifies a lot of these things. It has a lot of wrappers around some of these APIs that I was showing you before. And then we start um, capturing information from all these documents with Langchain. And then we start actually um, loading every single group into its token representations to understand how many tokens we have. So pretty much this is telling me that there are documents that do have 176 tokens. There are documents that have over 7,000 tokens in the document. When you interact with these models, there is also a limit of how many tokens you can pass when you interact with that model. That's what I do, this right here. So in order to avoid these large tokens per document, we start splitting the documents. And this is also an art. I didn't know. Splitting a document, it's an art when you try to pass it to an LLM. Why is that? And maybe I could show you here. Yep. You can actually split documents in chunks of 500, for example, let's say tokens. And then the overlap is 50. What does that mean? That if I have a document that ends on thread actor X, and then the other one starts with something else not related to that threat actor, especially when you have long documents of, of Intel of, of a threat actor, sometimes you don't keep the threat actor names all the way at the bottom. So maybe the information at the bottom might not be pointing to the top. And it's important to have some of that context in every single chunk. So the first thing you can do is say, I'm going to take the first chunk overlap that chunk and try to capture maybe some of that information. So that way I start making my, my, my chunks more similar. Another technique is in every single chunk, you just put the name of the threat actor. And now you have context of one chunk associated to the threat actor. So that's another technique that you can do, right? So once we do that, we're going to just uh, splitting all the data. And then I'm going to export it as a dat JSON L file. And why is that? It's because if you truly want to collaborate with people, if you really want to share your information, uh, like something like this, what I did is I created this document. 
that what it does, it gives you the ID of the chunks. It tells you that this chunk is zero uh, in zero, one, like one, two. So zero, one, index zero, index one. Those two chunks belong to one document. And then I provide the text, how the, the text was split. So now that I'm talking to data scientists, they want, to, hey, they want to know how I prepare my data. Now I could tell them this is exactly how I would, I would do it. And maybe you can use it on your own. And that's better because some of them don't understand some of this information. But our role as a security researcher uh, is to be able to share our knowledge. And that's what this presentation was about, right? To be able to take some of this knowledge that they know and how we're going to start using it to start even parsing what we know so they can use it, right? So this whole document has that splitting, how many chunks, some chunks all the way to even seven chunks, for example, et cetera. Okay. So then we, um, almost done in there, yeah. And then we create a database with all these chunks, right? I want to skip that one over there. What I do there, I just simply save all that in a pickle file for those that right, do Python programming. I just, I just saved all that information. Now I can start querying this knowledge. Right? So I do the same thing as before, import my variable, set my key, and now I set my database as a retriever um, object. So it would allow me to retrieve information from there. And then I just pass one query. My query is, what are some of the phishing techniques used by threat actors? When I pass this through the retriever, it's going to give me documents that are related to my question now. So now I can enable question and answering also with this information. So now I take all these documents that I received, and then I pass that as context, and then I ask the same question. And the, and the response was, threat actors have used spear phishing emails with malicious attachments, links to HTML application files embedded with, and you get the idea, right? So it was able to generate content, uh, new text, right? Generate text that now allows me to uh, simplify the way how I interact with my Intel database, for example. So if you're an Intel analyst, you might want to do that, right? Just to get some more insights that you might miss because you cannot read thousands of documents, split in chunks, and then ask questions, right? We can't do that, right? So this is what this is about. And you can apply this idea to anything, any type of knowledge in the security realm. There's a lot of stuff that I'm super excited to dive into in the next couple of weeks. So that, at the end, by the way, I took my JSON file, and now I contributed it to the Hugging Face Hub. So now that, uh, it's a file that people can use, download, directly interact with it. So that's my contribution to the community of, uh, <laughs> of the AI community. And that's all we have. Um, this is the link for the GitHub repo, which, by the way, I just want to make sure that it is it is private, no, yeah. so hopefully it lets me do that. And, uh, ah, okay, real quick, sorry. Oh my God, see, that's the inconvenience. Um, and just making it, uh, da -da -da -da. let's see. And of course I need to, I need to disconnect this, right, so otherwise. All right, I'll do it when I'm done. Um, <laughs> but what a way to finish the keynote with a contribution to the community and share some of these concepts so that you can take them back, experiment, inspire yourself, and just share your, your knowledge. This GitHub repo is to do that, is to share some of these experiments, and then you can take them and then make them your own repos and all that. Thank you very much for your time, and hope it was useful. Thank you.